Great. Steve, this is, uh, we've been trying to do this for some time, uh, but you and I both, I guess, are, are very busy people. We're really excited to have you on this webinar today. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah, it's been um, a long time coming. Yeah. And remind me, when did we, when did we start working with you? It's got to be, is it a year? Maybe a little less than a year? It's over a year. I think it was first March 2020. Wow. Um, at the start of the pandemic, I was, uh, you know, I found <coughs> Rudder Stack and started to speak to uh, <coughs> to you. Yeah, very cool. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, the journey that you took uh, the company you're with on from using Snowplow to uh, really building a fully integrated real-time stack. Uh, so we'll do some introductions. Uh, and then I think this is going to be really interesting because you and I have talked a lot over the last year, it's amazing to say that, about just some of the challenges that you had uh, with Snowplow and some of the ways that BetterStack unlocked those. And then I'm really interested in understanding uh, just the way that you've architected your stack uh, and learning more about that. I think it's always great just to learn how um, smart people are building uh, building their data stacks. Uh, and then we'll talk about what was the migration process like. And then of course we wanna know what you're gonna be up to next. Uh, so that's what we'll cover. Cool. So Steve, can you give us a little background on yourself and then tell us about iVendi? Yeah, sure. So I've been um, VP of um, software and R and D. I've been the um, coming on nine years now. So we do software, web services for the the automotive industry in the UK and also in Germany. Um, we act as a conduit in between the vehicle dealer, the consumer, and also the financer. Um, so we sit in the middle of all three and we try to provide services to everyone to make everyone come together to allow uh, people to, to purchase vehicles, um, you know, online in a yeah. safe, reliable way. That's great. Yeah, I know just, just from working with you, I know that, um, you know, it's in some ways a marketplace, uh, you know, marketplace software, which tends to be fairly complex. Um, and we can talk about the implications of that for your data stack. Um, I'm Eric. Uh, I run customer success at Rudderstack uh, and excited to be chatting about data stuff today. Okay, so let's just dig right in. You were using Snowplow. How long had you been using Snowplow? And then um, let's just talk through these, uh, these points that you pulled together around your challenges. <laughs> Not sure if you've got the latest slides, by the way. I think that those are, huh, oh, maybe we are missing that. Maybe Brooks, can you, uh, we'll just keep chatting through this. Maybe Brooks, do you want to go in and update the, uh, update the slides with the latest one? Uh, but yeah, why don't we just go ahead and start talking about it and maybe Brooks can dump those bullet points in there. Yeah, sure. So um, we've been running Snowplow and still are. Uh, probably for six or seven years now. Um, we first sort of acknowledged the need to sort of host our own and own our own data rather than giving everything to Google. Um, we heard that they were moving into the automotive space, so we really wanted to limit uh, you know, our exposure of our data to Google. Um, so at the time, Snowplow uh, was a great alternative um, to host our analytics. Um, yes. And of course, at that time, Snowplow only had a self-hosted version available. Um, have you found those slides yet? Yep, got it. Sorry for the technical hiccup. Here we go. I maybe edited the wrong ones. I don't know. Not a problem at all. Let me um, let me just pull these up here.
Okay, we are in business again. <clears throat> so self-hosted snowplow, because you had some pretty detailed analytics needs. The hosted version wasn't available when you started using it, which makes sense, right? Um, yeah. You know, starting six or seven years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the snowplow estate was AWS only um, in those days. I know it's a bit more flexible now, but it meant hosting uh, lots of separate services on AWS, EC2 instances, Redshift, you know, Elasticsearch, Kibana. And if you pop forward a few slides, two slides. Yeah. So all of those individual items we needed to stand up upgrade, look after, monitor, and for a small team, you know, a small data team, you know, inside a small SME, we just found we were hesitating to ever upgrade it because of the, the many different parts. And we found the data team was spending more time looking after Snowplow rather than looking after the data it was generating. Mm. Um, <clears throat> that's a common that's a common thing that we hear a lot with companies who try to build their own internal stuff not even using an external tool where so okay our engineering team is actually spending so much time working on the infrastructure and the pipelines we kind of call those like low level plumbing problems right they're just <laughs> trying to move data from one point to another point and it turns out that it takes an immense amount of time to maintain those pipelines, especially when you scale, right? When you start moving lots of data, you know, you run into latency issues, ordering issues. I mean, there's just a, a lot of stuff going on. I think another problem was because you're not inside of it every day. And when something does go wrong, the mental load to try and get back in there, understand mm. how it all works, to pinpoint the bit that's breaking and then how to... Um, you know, how to fix it, how to remedy it. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a great point. It's not the core, it's not the core software you're building. It's not the product um, that you're in every day. And that's, a, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. But yeah. they did roll out the hosted option and you, you looked at that, but decided that was just going to be too much. Yeah. So we had brief conversations with them, um, probably a few months before I spoke to Rudderstack. Um, but I think the pricing didn't align with, with our expectations, um, especially when COVID started to happen. Um, we had to look after the purse strings and um, you know it wasn't a viable option sure. for us. So we had to look for another revenue. Yep. And let's talk a little bit about the analytics were were good and you sort of said okay we need to get away from google analytics there's lots of limitations there um but flexibility was a really big deal um and we had talked uh when we were preparing just about how you know sort of from a just a basic analytics use case it was fine but you in fact needed to your stack had grown in complexity and you needed to make a lot more connections. Yeah, so if you flick through um, again and again. Yeah, so um, Snowplow, I mean, it markets itself on being uh, strict on the data governance, reliable and scalable. Um, but you'll notice a missing word there is flexible. Um, and for us, <clears throat> um, in order to create a new event schema, event type, uh, we just felt the process was onerous of having to curate that schema, publish the schema within Snowplow Igloo registry, and then also handcraft and create the schema within Redshift as well. And all those parts had to align for it to then enable uh, the data to stream through. So any of those parts you got slightly wrong, it wouldn't work. Mm. 
So then trying to embark on a new project with lots of new event schemas, um, the snowplow, you know, the thought of having to do it in snowplow, you know, just didn't fill us with joy at all. Sure. Um, other issues that we found, and I must stress it's, you know, it's always, it's not, you know, it might have been our implementation of snowplow, um, <clears throat> but we found any new event type, obviously meant creation of a new table in Redshift, but that side table, as it were, always had to join back to the core central events table, which meant, you know, after many years worth of data, queries degraded over time. Sure. Um, that became a limiting factor as well. Once your event tables got to a certain size, the sort of MI and the processing from Redshift um, starts to take longer and longer. Um, another thing that made us look away from Snowplow is they announced a, uh, you know, a relay initiative in 2018, which came with the promise of, uh, you know, inbuilt ability for these events to be passed, passed over to third parties, um, different tools. Um, but then a couple of years later, it had seemingly stalled because only one relay was available at the time, which was a relay into indicative um, a product analysis tool. Um, but that also meant you had to stand, stand up your own lambdas, which had to interact with the, the pipeline. So you were still actually having to do manual effort to enable an integration. So again, I was looking for a tool, you know, a system, you know, and, you know, a SaaS offering that meant, you know, our engineers could spend their time looking after the data and understanding the data rather than trying to get the data to where it should be. Yep. Um, and again, I'd be reading the data landscape had changed, you know, away from ETL jobs and Hadoop and it was more into real time streaming, data pipelines. And um, <clears throat> we just felt it's a nice, you know, it's a nice time. We had a new project that was coming up. Um, and we understood Redshift wasn't the prime database to enable the analytics that we wanted to store. Mm -hmm. So we started to look at you know, alternatives, found ClickHouse and thought, right, how are we gonna stream the data into ClickHouse? We can't do it through Snowplow you know, unless we write lots and lots of um, yeah. integration code. Um, yeah. So I was looking for a tool that could enable all that for us. And that happened to be Ruttersack. <laughs> We're glad you found us. Um, and could you just, I'd love to hear just a, just a, a brief overview of ClickHouse. <laughs> you know, people kind of think of um, you know, people run analytics on kind of the big three, Redshift, um, Snowflake, obviously, and then BigQuery. Um, ClickHouse is a really interesting tool, though, um, and you've done some really interesting things with it. Can you just talk briefly about, um, about ClickHouse? Yeah, so ClickHouse is the engine behind um, Yandex, which is the Russian Google, um, and I was aware of its present for quite a while on the uh, performance boasts and um, that they were coming out with, you know, I, I read Hacker News and Twitter stream with data engineers. So I was aware of it and started to look into it and just for some of our use cases, the um, query performance uh, compared to a like for like over redshift was massive, you know, 20, 30, 40 times quicker. Wow. Um, and especially we were embarking on a new um, search engine offering uh, and we had to provide statistics for each product that was, um, 
that came back in the search results page. So you can imagine 100 results per search. We had to store that information in order to give an impression count per. Oh, interesting, right. Per product. Uh, the search tool you know, of choice for us is Algolia. And their sort of analytics suite is limited on every, on every data item to the top 1,000. So if we're storing 200,000 vehicles inside of Algolia, um, the top 1,000 isn't good enough for us. Right. Because we need to give drill down analysis, analytics for each vehicle. You know, how many impressions, how many click throughs. Sure, and, sure. And I noticed that Yandex had a project up, which is based off um, the the Yandex search engine analytics, all hosted with ClickHouse. Um, some of the graphs, some of the search, um, the interface was exactly what we wanted to give our customers um, for this new search engine offering. Very so cool. It seemed a great choice. Yeah, and uh, we had a we had a fun time actually working with you um, to sort of architect the, the ClickHouse integration, um, which is now uh, used by lots of our customers. So that was a that was a really fun project. Yeah, that was good to. Um, I'll touch on that in a later slide. I think, so. Yeah. All right. Well, tell us about the end goal. So we've talked about sort of some of the limitations of Snowplow, some of the new mm -hmm. projects you had, but you know, you leading the engineering team. Uh, and managing all of these moving parts and sort of, of course, managing relationships with internal stakeholders, you know, like marketing and, you know, product experience and all that. W what's sort of your end goal when you look at the big picture, when it relates to sort of the data stack at iVendi and, uh, and what you're building? Yeah. Um, like I said, we were, um, you know, Snowplow had us frozen um, when product teams delivered new features, uh, it took a long time for a centralized data team to try and extract any meaningful information to give back to the product teams to, uh, to show them you know, how this new feature or how this A-B test was performing. So there was a massive time lag because they weren't able in any way to self-serve reports out of um, you know, out of Redshift. Um, so my end goal, I mean, my ultimate goal was to, you know, enable self service of data with the product teams mm. and also not be, uh, not to, you know, always use the same tools to allow flexibility, freedom of choice across the product teams. Because maybe some of them, you know, are skilled in, in, you know, amplitude or, or, or you know, indicative. Um, we wanted a tool that would flow, flow data into multiple destinations, so we weren't tied into any one sort of technology. Yeah. That's, a, that's pretty, that's an interesting dynamic, especially as an organization grows because, and this is an oversimplification, but a lot of organizations sort of start with Google Analytics and then you add maybe another analytics tool in the mix and then you realize, okay, well, that's not good enough and identity resolution is a problem. So then you, you know, sort of start with event streaming and then you realize, okay, well, we need to get all that into the warehouse as well so that the analysts can write SQL. And so, you know, you can kind of get into a, a sticky situation as far as you know analytics go and different versions of the truth um, as an organization grows if you don't sort of have all of that solved at the data layer. And of course, and um, there was a massive shift. Well, there still is to server side tagging away from mm. the traditional client side UI yep. um, tagging due to you know, performance and you know ad blockers and safari and you know all those different issues um so ga and snowplow you know, you're going to find it harder if you're just using those stacks yep. you don't get 20 30 40 percent of the traffic depending on your market sure right i mean that's enough to uh that's enough to 
make or break a business. Um, all right, so walk us through the details. So you <laughs> had these new projects starting with ClickHouse, Snowplow wasn't cutting it, you needed um, deeper analytics and then you needed flexibility for people to self-serve based on the same data. Uh, but walk us through these specifics, um, you know, as you evaluated the decision and, and sort of building your criteria. Yeah, so as we were doing, I mean, proof of concept for all this, um, trying to do a POC inside of Snowplow, you know, you've got that strict regime of, you know, event schema that has to be created, published. Your database has got to be, you know, updated and kept in sync. Now, I wanted a pipeline that I could just throw a schema at and it would end up in my warehouse. Hmm. Um, so, of course, Rudderstack will take whatever you throw it and it will curate the table and schemas for you. And 90% of the time, the schema that it <clears throat> creates, you know, is good enough for you to then create materialized views off the back of. Um, we also, you know, I wanted product teams to be able to go into Rudderstack and say, hey, I'm interested in these events that are streaming in uh, and point it to their product analysis tool of choice with very little, you know, or no engineering effort at all. They can just say, all right, I'm interested in this sort of event type from this team over here, stream it into my indicative. Yep. Um, and that's fully self-served. Nobody has to get involved apart from the product manager who can just say, yeah, I'll have some of that. So that obviously allows quicker turnaround time. I mean, everyone's agile now. They want fast feedback loops. So sure. the ability for product teams to push a feature live you know, A, B on their side and get the results within minutes inside of Indicative and the data team hasn't been involved, you know, is a win. Yeah. Uh, I was also, I mean, internally in IBND, we use event sourcing throughout the stack. Um, so the, you know, we love the ability to move the checkpoint right back to the start of time um, to replay those events to to either rebuild projections or produce new projections on the back of historic event data. So, Redux um, you know, <coughs> saying that they you know enable replay of events that have come in there, you know, is a great win as well. That just means I don't have to replay my events and then <laughs> to sure put us back if yeah you know all for me. Um, I must say at this point we did look at other alternatives um, to run stack. You know, I had you know I think I probably had five phone calls with segment with different people. Uh, at that point, I didn't even have a price, uh, but from reading. Hacker news and around the web, you know, if you're using a, you know, a not logged in, if you've got, you know, a large amount of anonymous users, segment ends up being very costly. Sure. Um, so I just thought we probably see about five million consumers in the UK pass through all our services. Um, you know, if we were to stream all that data into segment, it would cost us a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, especially sort of in an e-commerce type context where consumers are doing research and so there's very heavy browsing, you know, with a higher price point item like a car, they're going to create a lot of browsing data before they actually, you know, identify. And then those that do identify are probably a fairly small percentage of the total traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also had another requirement in that we work for you know, our customers, multiple vehicle dealers throughout the, um, throughout the UK and Germany, they all, of course, have their own websites and their own Google Analytics accounts and, you know, other tooling. So it's nice for us to be able to, you know, we were looking for a piece of software that was able to stream that data, not only to our own warehouse, but also to their accounts as well, to keep a seamless, you know, <laughs> engineer light 
pipeline. That is, that is such an interesting use case and actually something that we've seen more and more where there's either a sort of customer or vendor relationship or even an advertising relationship where there's some subset of the data that is being collected on your site that needs to be shared, um, which is interesting, or technology that runs on like lots of, you know, customer websites, um, you know, that needs to syndicate data or analytics back to them. And then another one that came up recently that was interesting is um, impression data for ads, right? So you can actually sort of track impression data for ads and then syndicate that back to, you know, the company that's running those ads is another interesting use case. And um, just out of curiosity, are you sort of using, you know, individual destinations and then transformations to kind of filter that to make sure that, you know, the correct data feed is getting to the, to the correct customer? Yeah, that's right. So we will analyze the, you know, various IDs on our side and then <clears throat> we'll either nullify out the event or we'll allow it through. Very cool. I mean, that's, that's pretty neat that you can just use the existing data feed and then filter it to provide analytics to your customers. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, walk us through the current stack. So you've been through a lot of this journey. Um, so tell us how you're running your stack and what you've put into it. Yeah, so we use the uh, Rudder stack JavaScript, you know, SDKs. We proxy the calls for our own servers um, purely so it's not considered third party. So we always get the, um, the tracks coming through and the you know, identifiers coming through. We also pipe events, server-side events through our C-sharp stack. And we also use, in a few places, the HTTP. Um, HTTPS webhook integration as well. <clears throat> so there's multiple sources going into Rudderstack. Yep. And then obviously Rudderstack facilitates the relays of those to you know, a combination of ClickHouse, Indicative, Slack, Redis as well in order to build up caches. Hmm. Um, another interesting part is, you know, obviously this snowplow to ClickHouse, you know, Rudderstack and ClickHouse is we can run them side by side because of Rudderstack's warehouse actions, which allows us to pull existing stroke legacy data out of um, the Snowplow database. And then I can pull that into ClickHouse as well. So that means I don't have to do a big bang migration here. I can run them side by side and piecemeal migrate the apps over. Oh, uh, interesting. Use. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really cool use for warehouse actions where you sort of incrementally migrate as opposed to having to dump, you know, years of historical data at one time, which, you know, there's, there's all sorts of considerations around that. Yeah, and it's useful. We've also got various lookup tables inside of Redshift and RDS. Uh, so it's very useful, those actions, just to pull that into ClickHouse. Yeah. You know, do you use, do you use warehouse actions for, I know you were talking about, I mean, this is kind of the replay use case. Do you use it for anything else? Not at the moment, no. Got it. Yeah, super interesting. That's a really cool way to approach migration. Yeah. Um, the last piece in the puzzle is we use Superset via Preset IO, which, which is a great, you know, it's Air, B and B's open source uh, BI visualization tool, but that fits nicely on top of ClickHouse and also supports most of the persistent engines as well. Um, we were using, you know, still our QuickSight, you know, AWS's QuickSight on top of Redshift and Postgres, but it's not, it's not the ideal tool. You know, Airbnb have invested a lot of time and you know, it's open source, so it's feature rich than uh, QuickSight is. Yeah, and that's sort of your highest level business intelligence visualization. Yep. Yeah, yeah, as well as the the indicative, the product analysis. Yeah, yeah, things as well. Yeah, that's a really common. I mean, 
I think that's where a lot of companies are going with their stack when it comes to analytics is that you sort of have some sort of layer on top of the warehouse, right? So um, Superset, Looker, uh, Tableau, obviously has been around for a long time, but some sort of layer that's sort of sitting on top of the raw data and maybe doing you know some sort of processing, but DBT actually we see a lot doing the processing and then just producing it for the visualization layer. Yeah, and yeah. then the downstream teams can use whatever other tools they want, right? It's like, you know, and at large organizations, actually, you'll see you know, sort of multiple product tools, certainly multiple like marketing analytics tools. Um, so that seems to be a very common architecture when it comes to uh, self-serve analytics. Yeah, and I'm not saying ClickHouse is our uh, and you know our end destination, but you know with Rudder, I can obviously start to use um, Snowflake in places if the needs arise and it proves to be the best tool. Yeah, for the job. Yeah, you know I'm not tied in. I'm you know. I've got a flexible architecture. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the great thing. I mean, I think, I think that when self-serve analytics first became a thing, people thought, okay, well, it's a BI layer on the warehouse, right? And it's actually a data feed that can pipe to any warehouse and any analytics tool is sort of flexible by any team, um, okay. which is interesting. Okay, so... Let's talk about Rudderstack. You've been, um, it's been so fun to work with you, uh, but we'd just love to know the specific ways that, uh, that Rudderstack helped you. Yeah, so, I mean, the best win for us is the ease of use, the, um, the ability to send a new event into it and it end up in ClickHouse within you know, half an hour. I've got that data. You know, and I don't have to do a thing apart from send the event over to Rutherstack. Yeah, I don't have to curate anything, hand roll anything, create schemas or do anything. It's, you know, and that allows me to be super flexible and run proof of concepts, trial and error, without having to do a lot of work. You can also show the power of certain events flooding in, you can single them out to send some into Slack so your business, people inside the business can instantly see, oh, you know, here are all these events of a certain type flooding in to a Slack channel, you know, and I've had to do a couple of clicks inside of Rudderstack to enable mm -hmm. that, you know, and people think that's great. <laughs> I don't have to hand roll my own code, I don't have to stand up and API sure. anywhere, I don't have to do anything. Yeah, that's one of those things that's funny where as a business user, you kind of say, well, can't I just get notified in Slack when this thing happens? But from an engineering standpoint, it's like, well, I don't, the number of like sort of pipelines you have to manage to make something that seems so simple happen if you hand roll it is actually pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can actually see now, I mean, people are talking, oh, that feature is going to be Q4. Uh, you know, and I can watch this conversation happening and I can, you know, enable it within a couple of hours. Mm. If that team's got to speak to this team, then we've got to deploy that. We're doing a few simple things to send Rudder some events and I can pipe it back into a different API for a different team. Very quickly, we've got an integration between the two. Mm. It may not be the perfect architectural, but at least it gets them going and they can get a first cut off functionality out there pretty quickly. So it enables the cross sort of team collaboration of data and, and without a lot of um, you know, engineering effort, and you know, it doesn't have to go into the back of the backlog and wait till for a few months time. You can enable things a lot faster. Mm. Um, Last but not least, I just wanted to show the uh, the power of Rudder into ClickHouse, and then you can see a small view of the array data I was talking about earlier. So each one of those rows in there is a list of 40 vehicles uh, stamped on one row. You know, all the information 
for those search results is held in one row inside a click house instead of 40 rows duplicating all of the data. So it's very efficient from a, from a data storage point of view. Uh, but at query time, I can unroll those arrays in order mm. to produce a normal standard table view, you know, as if it was not in arrays. <laughs> so it's a very powerful way of storing data and querying massive amounts of search result information. Yeah, when you think about e-commerce categories that contain sets of related information. Tags or anything like that, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Very cool. Well, let's talk about the migration process really quickly. So we talked about the challenges. We talked about your end goal, some of the things that you love about Ruddersack and that we've enabled you to do, but you actually, you know, you had to do the work of migrating. So tell us what that was like. Yeah, I mean, I've touched on it, but we didn't have to do a big bang. It wasn't one day Snowplow was there, the next day it was going to disappear. We can run the two side by side. Uh, you know, I first approached Rudderstack. You didn't have the ClickHouse integration available. I think another customer of yours had asked for it. I came along and you decided to put some engineering you know, effort into it. And I think it was roughly three weeks you had it, you had it turned around and enabled. So that was super cool. If you can find, you know, a partner who is willing to go that extra mile to turn around a new integration within a matter of weeks. Uh, it sent all the right vibes. Similarly as well, I think I put indicative in touch with you guys as well. And, you know, you turned that around pretty quickly, which was really helpful. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that is a fun part about where we're at as a company is that we work very closely with our customers to prioritize the roadmap um, sort of based on needs. So, you know, multiple customers need um, a destination um, and enough ask for it. And then we can prioritize that on the integrations roadmap, you know, because I mean, with the thousands of tools out there, the integrations roadmap is <laughs> basically infinite, right? Um, <laughs> But I would also say another thing for us, which is really fun to work with you and the other customers on as far as ClickHouse is, you know, there are, there's lots of marketing tools, there's lots of analytics tools, um, but generally the most important ones tend to be sort of core infrastructure tools, right? So working on things like data warehouses, um, you know, tools like Redis, um, streaming tools like Kafka or Kinesis, you know, these are sort of the parts of the data stack that manage customer data internally that are non-negotiable and are sort of core. And so, um, you know, at Ruddersack, because we build for engineering teams who then sort of serve the, the downstream teams of marketing and, and product, et cetera, um, you know, those are things that we wanna make sure we support because it just makes integrating your entire stack and your existing infrastructure so much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So while, you didn't have the ClickHouse integration. I was able to use another one that you did have, you know, Azure Event Hub, and spin up a little process which would take all the events off Event Hub and batch load them into ClickHouse. Um, so I only needed to stand that up for a few weeks whilst I waited um, for your engineers to, to finish. <clears throat> so currently, you know, I mentioned we're running both simultaneously. There's no big rush for us to migrate everything off. Um, like I said, we can pull data you know, out of Redshift using Rudderstack, stick that into ClickHouse at will. So there's no mad rush for us to work through all of our web applications that are sending Snowplow events and convert them to um, Rudderstack. We're going to do it in a methodical way. Yep. Yeah, um, that makes total sense. We can run them at the same time as well. So I don't have to remove the snow pipelines. I can just add in the rudder stack ones, run them side by side. Yeah. Yeah. And and since you're sort of running Snowplow on your own infrastructure, it's not like you need to continuously develop on it. You just need it to maintain stasis while you migrate everything over. Yeah. 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 Yep. 
Yeah, and you don't lose anything as long as you're using the same customer identifiers, you know, inside of Rudderstack and Snowplow, it's easy to join the data together. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to leave enough time for questions. Uh, so let's talk about what's next. What are you, now that you sort of have your stack in a place where it's flexible, your engineers aren't spending so much time on plumbing, uh, you've made the product and marketing teams happy. Um, what's next? Yeah, so obviously the added flexibility that you get with with a stack, you know, we've lost a bit of data governance. Uh, you know, I don't have to be as um, fastidious about event schema. I'd like to add that back in. Um, and I there's various tools out there uh, that can facilitate that, you know, from the design of new events and then handing over that information to your sure. UI teams, your different product teams, all the way through to your, your data engineers. Um, and I believe you may have something coming up that can help with that. Oh yeah, I'm excited. And your feedback actually has been really helpful in thinking through that. Data governance is a very important, but actually pretty tricky problem. And different tools have sort of solved it in different ways. Um, you know, of course you have the snowplow approach where there's a very rigid process to deploy, um, you know, and you sort of have this paradigm of things being strongly typed, et cetera. Um, and we looked, at, we looked at that pretty hard. Um, but ultimately when we talk, you know, with just tons and tons of data engineers doing work on the front lines, they said the same thing you did, which was, you know, I need to deliver value pretty quickly. And this isn't the way that this doesn't help me, but I also need, uh, I need better data governance. And so we're looking at integrating with tools, um, you know, sort of data governance tools that are out there via API. And yeah, then yeah. Uh, we've already started building several of our own tools that will actually allow you to enact data governance on the stream uh, via API in some pretty cool ways. Uh, because it turns out that there are certainly components that a UI is very helpful for, but things like version control, yeah. alerting, and other components like that, where you already have infrastructure and process you know, in your development lifecycle, uh, will really make data governance, I think, a lot um, easier to manage uh, because it's just so difficult. So to dumb it down there, you know, essentially if an event schema that's been coming through suddenly changes for whatever reason, there'll be some sort of interceptor inside of Rudder that will notify and, and you know, help you, you know, identify that. Yep. Yeah, we're pretty excited. Um, and there's, um, there's a team working really hard on that. And so uh, just keep an eye out uh, in the next couple of months. Steve, of course, uh, you've helped give us feedback. And so hopefully you can, you can give us feedback in, um, in maybe an early version. But for everyone else, keep an eye out because um, in the second half of this year, we'll have some, uh, have some stuff coming out that I think will be pretty neat. Excellent. Good news. Um, right. sorry. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, next one was, uh, you know, as a company, we're moving over to HubSpot. So the, you know, already in place, um, Rudder Stack integrations with HubSpot are going to come in useful. And with MailChimp, we can start to automate marketing campaigns and various, you know, various features like that with, you know, again, very little engineering effort. Um, to roll out this you know, ability for all teams to send their data into Rudderstack and you know, allow them to self-serve you know, into the tools of choice so they can get the feedback on their features, the data, the A-B tests quickly and they don't have to have conversations with different teams, which will hold them back. So hopefully you know, we can move faster with product development as a whole. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we have 
Um, we have some time left for questions. So you can, um, you can raise your hand, uh, pop something into the Q&A. Um, and I'd be happy to, if you wanna ask a question, um, you can raise your hand and I'll, I will unmute you. Um, one question here for you, Steve. H how big is your data team? And how do you have it structured? What are the different roles? Yeah, our data team is quite small. Um, there's probably three or four of us um, at the moment. Um, but we do work, I mean, we do billions of finance quotes every month you know, across all our websites, across all our services. Wow. Uh, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of data points. We have a lot of analytics. Um, so it's a very small team for the estate we have. We're trying to grow the team, but see data engineers, um, you know, are hard to come by, especially, you know, in our, you know, in the UK, never mind within our geographical, you know, in <coughs> Manchester in the UK, you know, they're pretty hard to find. There's lots of competition, so we aren't trying to grow the team. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, if there's anyone listening uh, in the UK and you're interested in, in working for a great data team, um, feel free to reach out. Um, another question, what, what were you using for marketing, um, for marketing before HubSpot? Uh, our old CRM was... Uh... I've completely gone blank. Well, that means it wasn't it wasn't that inspiring. <laughs> uh, um, I'll come back to that one. I'll just find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No problem. I'm embarrassed. Hey, that's uh, <laughs> on here. You lead the engineering team. I don't know if uh, I'm I mean, not just the CRM that often. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, I don't capsule. Capsule. Okay. Gotcha. Got it. Um. Yeah. You don't see that one super often. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming through. So I'll just ask you the last question. You know, any high level advice for someone sort of building out a data stack or starting on the journey that you were starting on? I just say, I mean, using Rudder Stack, even the, you know, the free trial on the cloud version allows you to proof of concept thing very quickly um, without, without a lot of effort. Um, and it's perfect, you know, especially if you've got a small, small data team or no data team, you know, it's a perfect starting point. Um, to get in there, maybe trial a few of the warehouses and, and um, just try them out. But, you know, having a rudder stack as the fulcrum, <clears throat> you know, it's very easy to switch and choose and prototype and uh, give things a little trial and try and, work things out because it's really hard to say right i need a data pipeline i'm going to choose this you know x y and z and be be focused you can read hack and news um i think there was a post in 2019 that said what's your bi stack and um, i think you got 200 different answers yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it is that you know it's diverse there's so many products and tools and databases available that it's really hard just to just to say here's our stack because every you know every use case is different um you'll need to analyze that and work out the best tools for what you need at this moment in time and probably protect you in the future if you can think that far ahead yeah i ask great advice flexibility is advice. you know it's key the ability to to pivot and shift if you have to though yeah i agree i agree even if you you know i think one example of that we've seen a lot is okay i signed an annual contract with this analytics tool 
well, guess what? Like when the year's up, people are going to say whether they like it or not. And if they don't, you're going to have to change it out. Um, and that is non-trivial if you've done a direct instrumentation. Um, well, Steve, this has been really helpful. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined. Um, we will send out a recording of this uh, for those who didn't join. And uh, thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much.